Hi guys. In order to keep the show ad free and increase the frequency of production, donations are a big help. Some of you have been very generous in donating, and I appreciate it greatly. If you could give to the show's Patreon account, it would result in good karma and buttress the show's prospects. The URL is www.patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash leader one, L-E-A-D-E-R-O-N-E, www.patreon.com slash leader one. Thank you so much. play hide and seek? You hide and I'll find you. Be advised that the individuals mentioned in this episode are identified by pseudonyms. Allison Cooper loved her father as most little girls do. She counted on him to love her. She counted on him to protect her. Unfortunately, she was betrayed by him in the worst way imaginable. It was Allison Cooper's father from whom she needed to be protected. Allison Cooper's parents were both born in North Devon, England. Tragedy struck early in the family's existence. Six months after her parents married, their first child, Tanya, died when she was only five weeks old. Tanya was left in a pram facing the fireplace and her mother left her unattended for a while. Despite the installation of a spark guard, a log somehow rolled out onto the mat underneath the pram, and the rug caught fire. They would have another two daughters later on, and one of them was named Tanya after the first Tanya. Allison was born on November 28, 1965, in North Devon, England. In 1975, the family moved to Ireland. They lived in a rural community called Loon. Her family lived in poverty. They were so poor there was no indoor plumbing in their small house, just a bucket with a plank over top. They did have running water. The house was not built on a concrete raft. It was put on concrete blocks. As a consequence, the house was always damp and cold. The floorboards rotted. Living in these conditions resulted in Allison and her sister Tanya getting sick on a regular basis. Her parents experienced difficulty finding employment. They didn't qualify for social assistance because they hadn't lived in Ireland long enough. For two years, Michael worked as a night porter and a bouncer. Michael was very quick-tempered, and he had a falling out with the owner of the hotel where he was working. He worked as a coal miner for a time, but the mine was suddenly closed without warning. Allison's mother was the primary breadwinner. At their new house, they raised livestock and did other farm work. Allison has described her father's appearance as very unkempt. He also neglected his hygiene for long periods of time. His hair was long, unwashed, and uncombed. He resembled a vagrant. He smelled unpleasant an odor reminiscent of mold or must. This was exacerbated by the stench of nicotine from his chain smoking. He didn't bathe regularly. He would have a bath once every two months, thereabouts. Though his wife laundered his clothes and laid out clean laundry for him, he would wear the same outfit for up to three weeks. He hated sleeping on clean sheets, so his wife only changed them every two weeks. People were so put off by his stench, they became nauseated. She described her mother as pleasant to talk to, but also spineless and easily led. She was also prevailed upon, easily, which was a characteristic her father exploited. 
Michael didn't involve himself much with the children except to ensure they were doing their farm chores and keep up with their schoolwork. At first, her father did a lot of work on the farm, but from 1987 onwards, he withdrew his contributions. He would sit around drinking and make Allison pick up the slack for him. Allison received mixed signals from Michael. Everybody said she was his favorite daughter. He would call her his little pet. He would do everything he could for her. He bought her nice gifts at Christmas. Sometimes he was a little too attentive, and she would feel smothered by him. One year just after Christmas, when Allison was still 10 years old, Michael entered her bedroom. He shoved her down on the bed. He tore off her clothes. He pulled down his pants and underwear. He pulled out his penis. He was erect. He got on top of Allison. He pinned her down with all his weight. He spread Allison's legs. He penetrated her vagina. He pushed it all the way in. It was painful for her. He ejaculated inside of her. She was bleeding afterwards. Her father didn't say one word to her throughout the event. She assumed it was a punishment for something. Afterwards, she froze. She didn't understand what had just happened to her. She didn't know what to do. She didn't know if it was wrong or a natural interaction between father and child. All she knew for sure was that it was very painful. She was scared, but she thought, If I cry, will he come back down and hit me or give out to me? It happened in the middle of the day. If her father wanted her to do work for him on the farm, he would keep her home from school. Her mother would be out looking for work. Sure enough, he called out to her, Come on, we've work to do. They carried on as if nothing out of the ordinary happened. She thought, well, whatever I've done, he seems happy enough now. She didn't tell her mother because she didn't know if what had happened was right or wrong. Two weeks later, Allison was still sore from the first assault. She didn't go to school one day because of a stomach flu. Her mother and sister were out. Her father called her into his room. He was in bed. He was clad only in socks and a shirt. No underwear. He pulled Allison on top of him. He pulled up her skirt. He seemed to view her clothing as some kind of daunting obstacle that had to be overcome. He grabbed her skirt at the waist. He tore it apart. He got on top of her and penetrated her. He ejaculated inside of her. She bled from her vagina once more. Nobody saw the blood spots on her underpants because she washed them herself every day. Michael began raping Allison more frequently. It would happen, on average, every three weeks. She didn't remember every incident, choosing to avoid the trauma of recollection. She would see the warning signs before he defiled her. He would push her down on the bed. If she did not disrobe voluntarily, he would tear the clothes off her. She made a practice of removing them willingly. It was either that or run out of clothes. Her family could not afford to buy new clothing all the time, as her mother was quick to remind her. On one occasion, she struggled to get up after he got on top of her. He hit her across the face. He told her she was a very naughty girl, and that he hit her as a punishment. He didn't specify what she did. He just said she had been naughty. Allison would do her chores with greater efficiency and frequency, assuming that by doing so, he wouldn't punish her with sexual abuse. It did nothing to stop the impropriety. Michael raped Allison for months. She was perpetually sore as a result. She didn't get to see her mother as much by this point because she worked a lot of shifts. One day her mother took her shopping. She appealed to Allison to update her on what was happening in her life. She said to Allison, Well, what were you doing all week? Allison told her she thought her father was doing something wrong. Her mother said, Why? Allison told her that he'd pushed himself on her, put his penis in her vagina, and ejaculated. Michael took to referring to his penis as his 
birdie. She said that he put his birdie inside of her and moved up and down on top of her. She asked her mother, Do all daddies do this, or have I done something to make him do it? Her mother went silent. She didn't seem to be angry. She said, Don't worry about it. I'll sort this out. It'll be okay. It won't happen again. That night, Allison overheard her parents arguing. She couldn't make out what was being said. Two weeks later, Michael raped Allison again. Her vagina was more sore than ever. It even affected the way she walked. She rode horses, so people assumed she was what they refer to in equestrian circles as saddle sore. At school, the other children would talk about the things they did with their fathers, like go for drives and other family-centered activities. Allison couldn't talk about what her father was doing to her. Allison's friends would ask if they could visit her at her house. She would say something to the effect of, No, I can't have you coming down. They would ask her why, and she would invent some kind of excuse. She would say things like, uh, It's not safe. The cow would kick you. Eventually, they stopped asking. Allison's attendance record at school was checkered. Out of 12 months, she'd spent a total of four or five months at home doing farm work. Sometimes when she did go to school, one of the nuns would keep her after dismissal time to help her catch up on lessons she missed. One day when she was late coming home from school, Michael hit the roof. He demanded to know why she was late. Who was she seeing, he wondered. He assumed she was seeing a boy, but she was 11 years old and had no intentions of dating. She tried to reason with him, but he refused her appeals and shouted at her. If only that had been the worst of the penalties. He pulled off her clothes and left her standing in nothing but a vest and panties in the kitchen. He said he would teach her a lesson for being late. He marched her down to the middle of the field. He made her stand there for four hours. It was so cold she turned blue. Her sister Tanya watched helplessly and cried. She knew she would have had to contend with her father's wrath if she had intervened. It was only when her mother returned home from work when Allison was allowed to re-enter the house. Her mother told him it was unfair, regardless of what she had done. She said he could have killed her. Her mother tended to Allison, helping her to warm up. Allison and Tanya shared a bedroom, but Allison never told Tanya about the sexual abuse. She felt it would have been inappropriate to tell her about anything sexual. She was well aware of the emotional and physical abuse. He only raped Allison when there was nobody else in the house. With her mother out of the house for long hours working at a factory, Allison was vulnerable. Tanya never had to do farm work. Allison was made to do most of it. From the ages of 10 to 15, Allison's father raped her about three times a week. If she resisted, he would punch her in the face or on the chest as hard as he could. During the act, the stench coming off him was sickening. After he finished, she would take a bath. She would scrub herself with the soap. Though she didn't smell like him, she was still anxious to wash herself free of him. She still felt like he tainted her with his scent. These experiences made her feel dirty, defiled, horrified. One day, the 10-year-old daughter of one of his friends came to visit shortly after he raped Allison. He said, Jesus, she's a nice bird. I'd like to get near her. There was still plenty of physical abuse. Allison received a gift from a girl at school. It was a pen and pencil set. Allison wanted to give her something back, and Christmas was coming up. Tanya wanted to give a present to a friend as well. Michael's response? You're not to ask me for money. You only want it to go out whoring. When he made that statement, Allison was 12 and Tanya was 10. He beat them both for asking for money. He would beat them with a belt. He would fold it in half, doubling the amount of pain he could inflict. He would strike them across the head, shoulders, chest, legs, and just about anywhere else. Once when she was 15, she was beaten and sent to bed for an entire week. 
She was in a car with two other girls and a boy. The boy owned the car and was teaching one of the girls how to drive. When it was Allison's turn to take the wheel, she reversed it into one of the two garage doors and broke them down. The boy covered for her, saying it was he who broke the doors. Allison told Michael that she wasn't even in the car at the time, hoping that this would prevent a beating. An old man who had witnessed the incident told her father what really happened. Michael told her about the lies she told after he beat her. He called her a liar and a cheat and beat her relentlessly. This time he used a whip. She was wearing a skirt, underpants, and a bra. He made her take off her t-shirt. He whipped her about the head, her arms, her shoulders, buttocks, and back. There were welts all over her body. Her mother would always ask him why he beat her, but he would say nothing. For the incident with the car, he did tell her she lied and blame shifted. She had a headache immediately following the beating. She had bruises all over. Every time she moved, she felt dizzy. She couldn't stand or even move her head. For the first days of that week, he wouldn't allow her to have any food or water. Due to her injuries, her mother had to help her get to the bathroom. While she was on the toilet, she would sneak a drink of water from the sink. She would flush the toilet to camouflage the sound of the water running so she wouldn't get beaten again. Her mother would smuggle in some food for her. She would stand up to him when he was beating her, though she would often get a few lashings too. November 1981. Allison was in her fifth year at school. She noticed something was not right inside of her. She missed a period. She experienced a great deal of pain in her stomach. By the time Christmas rolled around, she missed three periods. Her stomach was getting bigger. Considering all the farm work she did and the utilitarian diet her family lived on, obesity could be ruled out. Her mother brought her to a doctor. He told her it was due to overeating at Christmas. This wasn't good enough for her mother, so she took her to another doctor for a second opinion. After consorting with her mother, the doctor led her back in. Her mother was crying. Allison asked her what was wrong. The doctor said, you're pregnant. You're four months pregnant, and your baby is due in May. On the way home, her mother said, Is Daddy the father of your baby? Allison said, Yes. Her mother said, I'll put a stop to this. This was only the second time the topic of Michael sexually abusing Allison was dealt with. The first time they discussed it, her mother hadn't stopped it, and Allison lost faith in her ability to do so. Once at home, her mother told her father about Allison's pregnancy. He said to Allison, Well, after all that poking and prodding, you'd better go and lie down. Go and rest yourself. We'll do the jobs ourselves tonight. While Allison was in her bedroom, she heard her parents arguing. She heard her mother say, you shouldn't have done it. Why did you do it? She couldn't discern what his response was. At one point, she heard the sound of dishes being smashed. When she went out to the kitchen for tea, everything was swept up. Michael denied paternity. His explanation to everybody was that Allison was a whore, that she would give it away to any boy. He would say she had men calling her on the phone at 3 o'clock in the morning when the pubs were closing. He would quote these fictitious men with inquiries like, How much do you charge? What positions do you do? All she could do was listen and wish she were somewhere else. He allowed her to go to a disco when his mother was visiting. That way, her grandmother might assume that Allison was pregnant by somebody other than her father. Her grandmother asked him, Who's Allison going out with? I haven't seen her with a regular boyfriend. He would tell her that she would go out with anyone because she was a real whore. Allison's friends clued into what was going on, though they didn't tell adults and didn't take any action on their own. If she was pregnant and constantly covered in bruises, there was only one conclusion they could come to. Her teachers didn't say anything, though it couldn't have been more obvious that she was pregnant. The boys didn't bully her for being pregnant, 
but she received a lot of verbal harassment from the girls. They would accuse her of sleeping around, having so many boyfriends she didn't know who the father was. She couldn't bring herself to tell them she didn't have any boyfriends because she was too scared to date. She decided to keep the baby. A few years later, she ran away to her grandmother's house in England. She was visibly upset. Her grandmother said, Why are you so upset? Why have you run away? Allison said, If you must know, your son is the father of my child. I'm fed up with all the abuse. I just can't take it anymore. Her grandmother said, Well, I don't know what you expect me to do about it. Allison thought, Oh, shit. I'm after putting my foot in it now. I thought I could trust Granny, but I can't. Michael continued to rape Allison while she was pregnant. He told her that if the baby was a girl, her bags would be packed before she could leave the hospital. She could stay in his house if the child was a boy. He had always wanted a son. Michael beat Allison savagely after finding out the pregnancy was confirmed by the doctor. She was supposed to feed some lambs, but they weren't hungry and she postponed the feeding. She was hungry and pregnant, so she prepared a meal for herself. He hit her in the face and stomach with the belt, screaming at her that animals come first. After the beating, he made her finish her farm chores. Tanya did the farm work Allison had been doing because he didn't want to risk having an animal kick Allison in the stomach. Tanya never felt comfortable around the livestock, and this, in turn, made the animals uneasy, since they could smell fear. He would beat Tanya fiercely. Sometimes Allison would take the beatings to protect her sister. Sometimes during the pregnancy, Allison wished for a miscarriage. She drank a cup of liquid soap, but all it did was make her nauseous. She didn't want to keep the child, but she didn't want to run the risk of causing it to be born with a disability. May 20th, 1982. Allison gave birth to her father's son. She named him Ben. She was 16 years old. There was no doubt in her mind that her father sired the child. She hadn't had sex with anyone else. Michael only visited Allison once during her week-long stay in the hospital. Her mother visited her, but her visiting time was limited due to her commitments to her job. Because she was only 16, a social worker asked Allison if she wanted to put the baby up for adoption. Allison had become attached to Ben, so she declined. Her mother filled out all the paperwork. The father's identity was not indicated. Her mother also fell in love with Ben, saying, No, don't give him up. He's beautiful. Allison's sex education happened in the hospital postpartum. After learning about the act of coitus and the role it plays in romantic relationships, she realized that what her father had been doing to her was wrong. She felt ashamed. She didn't know what to tell people regarding the truth about the father. When Michael visited her, he took a look at Ben, who was lying in a cot beside her bed. He said, "'Geez, he looks just like a little monkey. "'Throw him out the window and see will he bounce.'" That was the last thing he said to her that day. A few minutes later, he left. Later, neighbors told her Michael was very proud when Ben was born. He bragged to friends at the pub, saying, I'm a grandfather. I'm delighted. She gave me a grandson. Michael would sometimes talk to the baby, but he never played with him. He only held him on his knee once, when Allison answered the phone. Michael never answered the phone. One of the social workers, Frances Whalen, visited Allison in the hospital. She inquired about the paternity of the child. Frances, we believe you've had a child and you're not married. Allison, yeah. Frances, is there anything you want to tell me about it? Allison, I want your advice. I wonder whether you can help me out. Frances, yes, go ahead and ask me. Allison reported all the abuse she suffered. Allison, Ben's my father's child. What can I do about it? Frances took a moment to think this through. Finally, she said, Well, look, I'm afraid I can't intervene. 
That's a family matter. You're going to have to do the best you can. Allison became disheartened. Nobody would help her. She resigned herself to the fact that she was helpless against her father's abuse. All Frances Whalen did for Allison Cooper was set her up with an unmarried mother's allowance. Frances said, You'll get that, and you'll get the child allowance, and we can fix you up with a few blankets for the child. Checks and blankets. That's all Frances Whalen did for Allison Cooper. Allison met with Frances again. Michael wanted adoption papers drawn up so he and Allison's mother could adopt Ben. Francis prepared the documents, but Allison wouldn't sign them. Three days after Allison arrived home with the baby, Michael raped her again. He went into her bedroom, pushed her down on the bed, and said, I want a bit of sex. Now that she knew what he was doing was wrong, she said, Don't do it. It's wrong. Michael hit her on the face and breasts. He pushed her on the bed and raped her. The first Sunday after Allison returned home, she had a bath and went to her bedroom dressed only in a dressing gown. Her mother and sister were not home. Michael approached her and said, I want a bit of sex. Allison said, You can't do this. It's wrong. You'll be put in jail for this. Her father said, You won't tell anyone. If you tell anyone, I'll be put away for life. Anyway, you like it. She removed her dressing gown voluntarily so he wouldn't tear it asunder. But she wasn't nearly as cooperative when he tried to penetrate her. She wriggled to prevent him from entering her. She was sore from all the dissolving stitches she received after giving birth. He punched her in the face and chest. He hit her in the stomach. He beat her with a belt. He was smoking at the time. He put his hand on her neck and held her down. He burned her all over her chest with a cigarette. He would press it into her until she could smell her skin burning. She didn't scream because she didn't want to wake the baby. She just lay there, crying in silence. The pain was excruciating. There were scars from the burns under her breasts that never faded. On another occasion, he tried to get on top of her, but she lifted her leg and hit him in the groin. The pain was intense for him, but she was the one who really suffered during this exchange. He hit her across the face with his belt. He punched her over and over and over again. He beat her up like he would have beaten up a man at the pub. He punched her so many times she was dizzy afterwards. She had to sit for an hour. She was so disoriented. One night when she was late coming home from the school disco, her father accused her of spending time with a boy. It wasn't true, but he beat her for this transgression. He broke her nose. Once when Tanya refused to help Allison with some prep work in the kitchen, Michael smashed Tanya over the head with the turnip Allison asked her to peel. Then he bashed her over the head with a carpet sweeper. She had to get three stitches to close the wound. This was the last straw for Tanya. She decided to run away to be with her boyfriend, Tom. She told Allison there would be a place for her there. Tanya never returned to her parents' home. Allison and her mother were forbidden from talking to Tanya from that day forward. She wanted Allison and her mother to attend her wedding, but she didn't invite them because she knew Michael wouldn't let them go. That, and she also knew that if he did take them, he would ruin it somehow. Four to five months after the birth of Ben, Michael was raping Allison every two weeks. He said to her at one point, You're old enough now, you'd better go on the pill. When her mother asked him why, he said, Well, she might find a boyfriend and she might need to go on it. Her mother took her to the doctor to get a prescription for birth control pills, but she never asked Allison if Michael was still raping her. Allison elected to take the pill because it was clear nobody was going to help her out of the abusive situation in which she lived. She also could not bear to undergo the process of being pregnant and giving birth again. When Ben was older, 
Michael insisted that he sleep in his room with his wife. The only happiness Allison experienced during these years was when she spent time alone with Ben. Throughout the years, Ben would ask Allison who his father was on occasion. She promised to tell him when he was 15 or 16. She felt he would be able to understand at that time in his life. During the interim, he assumed his father was a man who didn't love his mother and couldn't be bothered to raise him. He did find out the truth about the paternal element of his conception. He was hurt when he found out that the man he knew to be his grandfather was also his father. The court case received coverage in the media, and he learned about what Michael had done by watching the news. He said he wanted nothing to do with Michael again. He didn't want to see or hear from him. Soon after Michael was sent to prison, he made a wooden plaque with a photo of Ben on it. He sent it to Ben. Ben only wanted to burn it. Allison wouldn't let him. She felt he might want it around once the anger and pain went away. Allison was notified that because Ben was inbred, he might have mental or physical health problems. She had him tested and examined his educational performance. He did not suffer from complications of recessive traits. Though he was devastated and enraged to learn about what his father had done, there was no long-term psychological damage. It's a miracle that this was not so. He was raised to believe his mother was his sister and he addressed her as Allison. He called her parents Mammy and Daddy. He watched Allison's mother get beaten. He watched Allison get stripped in front of everybody. When he was nine years old, he watched Michael tear off Allison's shirt and brassiere. Aside from Ben, Allison only received affection from the livestock she cared for. The cows and calves felt uneasy when Michael was around, since he was constantly shouting. The violence at home continued. Michael had used a bar off their oven to hit Allison and her mother. One time he split her mother's head open and left her unconscious for four hours. The wound bled for a long time, and she needed stitches, but Michael wouldn't let her go to the hospital to have them applied. Friends of hers at work became concerned by the depth of the gash, and they took her to the hospital. Nobody asked her how she acquired the injury. He used the same implement to break Allison's wrist on another occasion. On none of these occasions did he ever express remorse or concern for their well-being. He dented a saucepan by hitting her mother over the head with it. He gave Allison's head a lump when he hit her with the same saucepan. He hit Allison with a bar across her ribs, and her skin burst open. She needed six stitches, but he wouldn't let her go to the hospital until the wound healed. She couldn't bend down, and her other movements were restricted. When she did finally go to a hospital to have the injury examined, a doctor discovered in x-rays that her ribs were cracked. Another time, she went to the same hospital after Michael kicked her in the legs to knock her down. While she was on the floor, he kicked her in the ribs. Allison's nose is permanently crooked because Michael broke it so many times. If something fell to the floor, he would get angry at Allison and demand that she pick it up. She had to be wary as she knelt because he would often kick her in the crotch. If she managed to avoid getting kicked in her midsection, he would run around to the front of her body and kick her in the face. On two occasions, he kicked her face so hard he broke her jaw. Once when Allison and Michael were having a drink at a pub, an old school friend of Allison's dropped by the table to make small talk. When Allison and Michael returned home, he belted and punched her. He accused her of making plans to run off with her friend, which she did not. She was wearing a black dress she was very fond of. He tore it off and kicked her with his steel-toe cowboy boots. Once while they were driving home from a sheep mart, he was drunk and began strangling Allison in the car. He said to her, I'll sort you out when I get home. When she got home, she did some farm work. Afterwards, he hit her with a belt and a two-foot length of rubber pipe. He tore off her shirt and bra. He broke the strap of her watch. 
He even stripped her of her jeans, underwear, and socks. This was punishment for speaking to an auctioneer at the Sheep Mart. He abandoned her at the barn. She had to walk home in the farm fields completely naked. A couple of her neighbors saw her. Her feet were bleeding by the time she got home. Allison was admitted to hospital seven other times when Michael abused her. Her mother never protected her or reported what was happening. He would beat Allison if she didn't give him her mother's allowance. He would spend it all at the pub. The beatings were sometimes witnessed by other people in public, but most people did nothing to intervene. He would buy her alcohol at pubs and get angry at her for getting drunk, which would result in a beating. His drinking worsened over time. On one occasion, he stripped her naked in a barn in cold weather. He raped her after he thumped and punched her into submission. One night when Michael allowed Allison to have a drink with a young man she knew at the pub, he went home and strangled all her pet birds as a punishment. When he picked her up, he said, Why did you go off with your man? You're only looking for the thing every other woman wants. You're no good. He went on to say, Jays, you know what? That little bird of yours, the one you had trained, she sang to me while I had my hands around her neck, killing her. When they returned home, he forced her to clean the area where all the dead birds lay. Her birds meant a lot to her, and she was devastated. None of their animals, whether livestock or domestic pets, would go near Michael. May 1990. A cow broke through barbed wire to get to a calf in a house. In the process, she injured one of her teats. When Allison explained this to her father, he accused her of lying. He hit her with his hand and a belt. Following this, he made her put her hands out palms down. He pounded them with a hammer. He cut her up with a slash hook for another incident when he accused her of cutting the cow's teats on purpose. Another time he smashed her fingers even harder. He wouldn't let her have the fingers examined by a doctor. One of them was unbendable. When she finally did have it looked at, she was informed that the nerves were damaged and it would never improve. The other fingers healed, but ended up crooked. She still experiences intense pain in the cold to this day. When Allison was 19 years old, she told a doctor that her father was having sex with her. The doctor summoned her parents in. Michael stormed out halfway through the meeting. The next morning, Allison took Ben to a hotel in Dublin. Later in the year, she ran away to England. She was at her grandmother's house for two days when her father showed up. He brought her back to his house in Ireland. After they arrived, he beat her viciously with his hands and belt. He raped her twice in her bedroom over the span of two hours. Allison reached her limit of how much abuse she could take. She decided to run away for good. She borrowed some money from a friend. She went to Devon, England and stayed at an old school friend's house. Michael called a friend who lived in Devon. By the time he went to retrieve Allison, he knew where she was staying and who lived there. She was in a pub playing pool with some friends when he walked in. He said, Get out, you whore. You're not staying here on your own. After her mother and Ben went out to visit someone, Michael shouted at Allison and beat her. He punched her and hit her with his belt. He beat her in the back until it was black and blue. He tore off her shirts. He burned her chest with cigarette butts. Allison went to her doctor and told him her father was still abusing her and that Ben was his child. The doctor said, I can't exactly do anything until I talk to your parents. Allison said, What can I do? If Daddy finds out I was talking to anyone, I'll get a beating. I don't know what to do. I'm scared. The doctor said, Leave it with me and I'll see what I can do. I'll get back to you. She gave him a friend's address so he could correspond with her. One day her mother opened a letter from the doctor's office indicating an appointment was arranged and they were expected to attend. 
They did attend, and when Michael was confronted about the paternity of Allison's child, he simply said, that's not true, and walked out. The doctor said to her mother, please do something about this. It's a serious offense. Your husband won't talk to me, so there's not a lot else I can do. At home, Michael said to Ben, your mother wants to have me put away for life. When she visited a social welfare office, a social worker told Allison there was a home for battered women in Dublin. She took Ben there with her. After explaining what her father had been doing to her, they let her stay and arranged to have her set up with social assistance. Somehow Michael found out where she was, and he went there. He sat outside the house for three days in all weather conditions. He harassed women who went in and out. He would peek into prams to see if Ben was in them. He made residents and staff so uncomfortable they asked Allison to leave. With no alternative place to go, she went home. After returning home, Michael beat her with his belt and a length of rubber pipe. He beat her about the back and head. He took her to her bedroom. He took off all her clothes. He pushed her down onto the bed. He raped her aggressively. He hit her on the face and chest while he ejaculated. She described it as the worst rape he ever put her through. Her lips swelled up and bled as he hit her on the face. After he was finished beating and raping Allison, he left and locked the door behind him. So she was trapped. She was relieved it was over, but two hours later he returned and raped her again. This round was even more violent. He hit her more than the first time. After he'd finished, he said with deep hatred, You'll never run away again. He left the room without locking the door. Allison resigned herself to the fact that the abuse would never end. There was nowhere to go and no one to protect her. Allison assumed Michael punished her for running away because she took Ben with her. Because of this, the next time she ran away to England, she left Ben behind. When she arrived, her grandmother was taken aback by her appearance. She said Allison looked as white as death. Allison told her she had a row with her father and she was never going back. She told her once before that Ben was Michael's son. She didn't believe her then, but this time she did. She said, do whatever you can, but make sure he gets punished for what he's done to you. Later that night, Michael called her grandmother. He said, do you know where Allison is? She said, no, sure, how would I know where she is? Michael put Ben on the phone. Ben said, where's Allison? I want Allison. I'll die if I don't get Allison. Where is she? This was heartbreaking for Allison, but she still could not return to Michael. Three or four days later, Michael showed up at her grandmother's house. Allison was in the bathroom and she heard him say, Where's the bitch? I'll get her. Her grandmother said to him, You're not to start trouble in this house. I know everything you've done. She's told me, If you start any trouble now, I'm going to get the police. Michael said, Oh, I'm not starting any trouble at all. Don't think that for a minute, mother. I just want to bring her home where she belongs. She's after putting that little fella Ben through hardship. He's at home crying. He wants his mother. He took her back to Ireland. After they returned, he said to her, You know what to do. Allison removed her clothes and got into bed. He came into the room and said, Get outside the bed. He raped her. She submitted to him because it seemed like there was no escaping that fate. Michael told Allison's mother to buy a Polaroid camera. A few days later, he told Allison and her mother to go into his bedroom. Her mother said, What do you want a photograph for? He said, Well, what if one of you dies? I want to have a photograph to remember you by. Allison began to worry that he was planning to kill her. Some family photos had been taken before. Her mother asked him, What exactly do you mean? Michael said, I want photographs of the two of you naked. 
Once they were all in the bedroom, he removed his clothes and I ordered Allison and her mother to remove theirs. He said to her mother, I want you to take a photograph of me and her together. He pushed Allison on the bed and pulled her legs up in the air. He froze her in tableau with her buttocks on the edge of the bed. He posed in such a way as to look like he was performing cunnilingus on her. Allison's mother refused to take the photo. She just froze every time he ordered her to. Finally, he went over to her and punched her in the vagina, chest, and face. He cut her eye. He said to her, Now, you little bitch, take the photograph. Her mother found it difficult to frame the shot with all the blood pouring into her eye, but she managed to compose it as he would have wanted. This was the first time her mother witnessed him raping Allison. Michael told Allison to get off the bed and ordered her mother to take her place. Allison was ordered to take a photo of her mother performing fellatio on him. She was also forced to take a photo of them having intercourse. After he dismissed Allison, she ran to the bathroom to scrub herself clean. That is how dirty he made her feel. It also made her feel cheap. The photos were used as evidence at his trial. Later, her mother went to Allison's room to use some of Allison's cosmetics. She covered up the bruises on her face with some of Allison's powders. Christmas 1991. A trip to England to spend the holidays with Allison's grandmother was planned. Michael decided to go. He also decided the reason his wife wasn't going was so she could sleep with other men. He flew into a rage one day and started abusing both her and Allison. He started by beating Allison with his belt and fists. He did the same to her mother. There were some groceries on the table. He threw a can of peas at Allison. She managed to dodge the projectile. It flew through the window. He became even angrier after this and threatened her with the worst beating of her life. She ran towards the bathroom, but he caught up with her. He hit her for a long time. After this, he went to the kitchen where her mother was. He grabbed a boiling kettle and threw the scalding hot water over her mother. She was wearing enough clothing to avoid injury. He called Allison into the kitchen. He ordered her to boil some water in the kettle so he could do the same to her. Having been boiled, he launched the kettle at her, but she ran out of the room. He threw it so hard that when the kettle landed on the floor, it split in two. Dodging these objects sent him over the edge. He started throwing knives at her. He picked up what remained of the kettle and threw that at her. Still unsatisfied, he whipped her with his belt. It went on so long she couldn't recall how long it took. When he stopped, he finally noticed the broken window. He told Allison and her mother to call a local handyman to replace the glass. Allison and her mother got into the car to go to the man's house. Allison's nose was bleeding. The rest of her face had been smeared with streaks of blood. There was a cut on one of her arms from when Michael threw one of the knives at her. As they were pulling out of the driveway in their van, he came out and threw the remains of the kettle at the vehicle. He threw a knife at the tires in an attempt to puncture them. Michael returned from a pub later. He started beating Allison because she had farm work to do, but had procrastinated. He beat her for an hour. By this point, she was standing naked in the kitchen, wearing only her undergarments. Ben had witnessed this and was deeply upset. She was made to sit in the kitchen where it was freezing cold because the window hadn't been repaired yet. A Garda, which is an Irish law enforcement officer, arrived at the house and questioned Michael about an incident that had been reported involving members of the household having a row. It had actually been Allison who made the call, but she claimed to be a neighbor. Garda Tom Walsh said to her father, What's happening, Michael? Michael said, Ah, these two just had a row. They were fighting, and I stepped in and stopped them. Walsh considered the state the two women were in. He didn't buy it. When Allison returned to the kitchen, Walsh asked her if she wanted to make a statement. She said no, fearing the consequences from Michael if she did. As a result, nothing changed for the time being. 
One day in 1989, Allison was working in the kitchen. Ben and her mother were not at home. Michael came into the room and said, I want a bit of sex. Fearing a reprisal, Allison reported to his room and disrobed. She kept her jumper and bra on, but she was naked from the waist down. She laid on her back, as always. Michael said to her, No, turn over. This was new. She turned over and lay on her stomach. He got on top of her back. He spread her legs and put his hands on the bed next to her breasts. He put his penis between her legs and forced it into her anus. It was so painful, Allison screamed. She screamed nonstop. He hit her in the face and told her to shut up. He raped her anally for 20 minutes. Normally, Allison could dissociate from the sex her father forced her into. It was impossible this time. The pain kept her soldered to the present. She never produced vaginal fluid when he raped her vaginally, so she was puzzled that her buttocks were wet. When she got up, she saw blood on the bed. She went to the bathroom, put sanitary napkins over the wound, but the bleeding would not stop. The more she moved, the more she bled. Allison asked her mother if she could go to the doctor and have the bleeding looked at and treated. She assumed she was talking about her period. She knew Allison's period did not occur at that time of the month. Michael would not allow Allison to seek medical attention. The bleeding continued for two or three days. It made it extremely unpleasant to do her chores, but if she hadn't, Michael would have beaten her. So she suffered through her routine. He raped her anally two months later, and it was no less unpleasant. Allison came to resent her father so much she had violent and homicidal fantasies about him. It seemed like she would never be free of the abuse as long as he was alive. Allison and Michael went to England for Christmas. They stayed with his mother. For the most part, he was well behaved. He didn't abuse Allison, and he even curtailed his drinking. That is, he was well behaved until the last days of the trip. His drinking got out of control again and he was kicked out of pubs. His mother disapproved of his behavior, and he became indignant. He decided it was time to go. On the way to a train station on the last day, at nightfall, Allison was walking in front of Michael. Suddenly, he kicked her in the back of her leg. She was carrying both of their bags, and she collapsed to the ground. As she was on her hands and knees preparing to rise to her feet, he ran around to the front of her and kicked her in the eye. She fell back to the ground. He started pulling at her shirt. He said, Get up, get up, you bitch. That's not good enough for you. Allison's eye was bleeding. Her vision was blurred in both eyes. Because she couldn't see, she tripped over the bags and fell back down. Michael started whipping her with his belt. The more she moved, the worse the beating became. Allison heard footsteps. They were not Michael's. A flashlight was shone into her eye. She heard a man say, Jesus, what's going on here? Michael turned to the man and said, Oh, I caught this one with a fella, and we're going home. We can't have her whoring around the town here. The man said, There's no need to beat her like that. He turned to Allison and said, Do you want a doctor? Allison said, Please get me a doctor. Take me somewhere so I can get a doctor. Michael tried to assault the man, but he was so inebriated the man would always push him and Michael would fall to the ground. Finally, the man said to Michael, If you don't sit there, I'm going to give you a hiding, exactly like you've done to this girl. The man asked where they lived. Michael told him they were Irish citizens on holiday. He told him that if he wanted to take her to a doctor, he could, and he would tear up their boat tickets. The man got fed up and left. Michael got up, kicked Allison in the legs, and said, Come on, get up. We're going to Barnstaple. They walked on. Allison was seeing double. After a long trek, Michael told her to go in a phone booth and call for a taxi. Not only did she have difficulty reading the phone numbers in the book, but she was feeling faint and dizzy. She was actually calling a doctor's office, but she only got an answering machine. He told her they would continue walking. 
She slumped down to the ground. She was still faint and dizzy. She thought she was going to pass out. He still made her carry both of their bags. He forced her up and they walked for miles. They came upon a couple in a car who were turning into their gateway. Michael approached them. He said, I wonder could you help me? We've been mugged down the road. Three fellas mugged us. I held off two of them, but my daughter got badly beaten by the other one. I'd appreciate it if you could get us to a hospital. It turned out the woman went to school with Allison's mother. Allison still maintained contact with them. They drove Michael and Allison to a hospital. Allison received six stitches in the cut above her eye. She was still dizzy and found it difficult to get off the bed. When they returned home to Ireland, Ben was in the car that brought them to their house. He took one look at Allison's eye and started screaming hysterically. He didn't stop screaming for a long time. Allison's mother asked what happened once they got home. Michael said, Look what I did to her through drink. Allison lost almost all her vision in her right eye. Michael's reflective statement on the damage he did to her eye, Look what I've done to you. How do you think I feel? January 12, 1992. Michael went into Allison's bedroom that evening. He said nothing, just pushed her on the bed. Well, actually, he did say one thing. Get them off. Allison took off her pants and underwear. He got on top of her and raped her in his customary way. It was the morning of either the 13th or 14th when Michael went into the kitchen and said to Allison, I want a bit of sex. She removed every article of clothing except her bra. He raped her. It was a routine event by this point. Afterwards, Allison went to the bathroom and washed herself. One day when he suspected her of being intimate with local boys, he started calling her a whore. He hit her. He beat her with his belt. He punched her. He hit her over the head with a bottle. It left her with a bleeding lump. Later that day, after a visitor left, Michael started hitting Allison again, blaming her for having blinded her. Ben was in the room. Michael pulled off Allison's t-shirt and bra. He pointed to her breasts and said to Ben, Take a good look, son. This is the difference between a man and a woman. Both Allison and Ben felt degraded. Michael started hitting her again. He cut her on one arm so deeply she had to get three stitches. He hit her with a salad dressing bottle and broke her finger. He threw mugs, plates, and knives at her. He made her sit on a chair as he ranted and raved. He beat her with a strap. He walked away and returned with a lit candle. He held it under her breasts. He took a cigarette and stubbed it into the skin along her chest. She was horrified by the malevolent look in his eyes. She had never seen him so malevolent. She feared he would kill her this time. Once he was finished burning her, he told her to put on another t-shirt. All she had on were a t-shirt, jeans, and socks. He pushed her out the door and said, If you want to go whoring, I want the money. Go on. Get the one who's going to pay the most. Ben witnessed all of these events. Allison went out to the garage. She stood there for ten minutes. She heard her mother scream at Michael. She heard her say, You've hit her enough. Now leave her alone. This did not reassure Allison. She just thought, Christ, he's coming after me. I have to go. While Allison went to the home of a friend, Michael threw a tantrum and smashed several of the family's belongings. He broke Allison's jewelry and threw the pieces on the floor. Allison went to the home of another friend. She collapsed when her friend opened the door. Allison was taken to a doctor. They stitched up a cut on her head. She also received stitches on her arm. There was almost no end to the bleeding from her head. She was taken to a hospital. They took x-rays of her skull and fingers. When a doctor took a blood count, he informed her there was only about two pints left in her body. The ideal count for blood is four pints. He said that if she had continued to bleed for another two or three hours, 
she would have died. She felt weak. She was so disoriented she didn't know what was going on around her. The doctor took Polaroids of the bruises on her back, chest, legs, and the stitches on her head. Allison told him she was assaulted by her father and that she wasn't going home. She wasn't going to lie to this doctor like she had with others. She told him about everything except the sexual abuse. 3 a.m. The police went to Allison's family's house. Her mother happened to be awake at the time. Michael was asleep. Ben was awake. He wouldn't go to sleep because he didn't know where Allison was. An officer said to her mother, Is Mr. Cooper here? Her mother said, Yes, he's in bed, but please don't wake him. Why? What's wrong? The officer said, Do you know where your daughter is? Allison's mother said, No, I'm waiting for her to come back. The officer said, Well, she won't be coming back. She's in a hospital. You're very lucky that there wasn't a murder committed tonight. Allison's mother began to cry hysterically. When Ben came out and saw the officers, he began to cry too. Michael was woken by the commotion. He went out to the kitchen. The officers explained the situation with Allison. They asked him what happened. He said, Sure, I hit her a few times with my fist, but I didn't do her any damage. It must have been whoever she was sleeping with last night that hurt her. Her mother and Ben went to visit her the next day. Ben didn't want to leave. The next day, Michael came in. Allison told the nurses she didn't want him to visit her, but they may not have seen him come in. When he came into her room, the woman next to her said, Ah, oh, isn't that nice, your mammy and daddy coming in to see you after your accident. She said this because the nurses told her Allison had been injured in a motor accident. Michael said, Right, you're okay today. Now pack up your things and come home. Mammy will be in for you in about 20 minutes. With that, he left. No apology, no goodbye. When Allison's mother visited her, she conveyed instructions from Michael. She was not to sign anything or make any statements on the record. Allison ignored this and made a statement to a police officer. She vowed to herself after her father blinded her that he would never hurt her again. She was more determined to move out of the house than ever. The violence was escalating in brutality, and the injuries no longer just lingered. Some were permanent. This was her last chance to escape. A social worker informed Allison that if she made a statement against her father, she could be placed in a home where she would be protected. Allison asked her, What about Ben? I have to get Ben. She said, That's okay, we'll just watch, and when he goes to school, we can get him out. With this as reassurance, she was prepared to make a statement to the police and agreed to do so. Allison told Garda Agnes Reddy about the physical assaults initially, Later, she told her about the sexual abuse. Two days later, she told her that Michael was Ben's father. Reddy wrote out an official legally binding statement, and Allison signed it. She told Allison she would remain in touch with her. Allison was placed in Oasis, a women's hostel in the town of Waterford. Agnes retrieved as much of Allison's clothing as she could from the house. Michael burned some of it. She also collected Ben's clothing. Allison and the social worker went to Ben's school to get him. When Michael was informed about what was going on, he said to Allison's mother, Go straight into the school and get Ben. By the time her mother got to the school, Ben was gone. She went out to Michael and told him he was gone. Michael approached some guards and told them Allison kidnapped Ben. Michael told them he had adoption papers for Ben. But when the guards looked into the matter, they said to him, Nope, she's perfectly within her rights. It's her son. Michael said, Well, I adopted that child, but it was no use. Fortunately, Allison's mother didn't tell Michael that Allison didn't sign the adoption papers. While at Oasis, Allison always feared Michael would find her. A man he knew named Seamus found out Allison was living there, and Michael told him that if he ever found her, he was to report the location to him. But Seamus never did. Allison was kicked out of the home when Ben was falsely accused of sexually assaulting one of the other children. 
The woman who made the allegation was afraid Allison would get housing before she would. Allison got together with Garda Reddy and gave more detailed statements about what Michael had done to her. One day around this time, Allison was hitchhiking with Ben in tow when a man named Thomas picked her up. He asked her along the way if she would like to go for a drink. They would later fall in love and get engaged. Allison and Thomas moved to a town called Erlingford. Her parents lived in the same house. Michael still drank, though he was now attending meetings at Alcoholics Anonymous. He began attending them after Allison left home for good. He would drink the day before each meeting. One day, Allison got Thomas to drive her to her mother's workplace. Michael didn't leave the house much anymore. Her mother looked haggard. She was in tears. Allison asked her what was wrong. Her mother said, Yesterday he beat the shit out of me because I wouldn't bring him back a bottle of whiskey. So today I had to bring him back a bottle. I'm afraid to go home. Michael had been passed out on the floor since one o'clock. She did not want to be around when he woke. Allison wanted to take her away from that place, but her mother wouldn't hear of it. She felt she couldn't leave. Once when Michael went to England to visit relatives, Allison went to the house to visit. Her mother invited her to stay for a couple of days, but she didn't last more than a few hours. Seeing the place triggered so many unpleasant memories of the abuse, it overwhelmed her with post-traumatic stress. Michael was more reclusive than ever. Allison's mother experienced complications from blockages in her arteries. When she returned to the house, it smelled worse than ever. Michael was so determined to keep a low profile, he didn't want to risk having the toilet flushes heard by their neighbors, so he let the toilet fill to the rim. He was supposed to give her mother checks to cover expenses, but hadn't done so. Allison called him and urged him to hand over the checks. He asked her where she was, but she wasn't about to tell him. He acted like he was caring and loving, but Allison didn't fall into this trap. Her mother continued to visit Allison. Michael would say to her before she left, You're meeting her. Can't she write a few lines to me? He was beating her mother, and Allison would write him in an effort to stop the abuse. Her mother would tell her what he wanted to hear, and Allison would write it. Examples of such statements were, It'll all be over soon. Ben's fine. I'll be home soon. Or, don't worry, we'll all be one happy family again. Allison told the guards she was sending these missives to protect her mother. She didn't mean a word of what she wrote to Michael. It was just the best protection her mother had until Michael's arrest. Allison's mother spent four weeks in the hospital. Michael didn't leave the house the entire time. After she was discharged, she went to the Garda barracks to make statements against him. She only did it under the proviso that they wouldn't say anything about the statements before Michael was charged. Allison made a statement of her own, saying, Mammy can't continue this way. She's sick and, with all the harassment from Daddy, she's only getting worse. She just can't take it. Superintendent Duffy said, Well, things might be moving sooner than you think. Allison received a phone call from her mother two days later. Her mother was ebullient and speaking so fast Allison could barely keep up. Her mother said, They came and arrested him this morning. I've peace at last. Allison wanted to hear all the details right away, but her mother insisted on telling her in person. When the guards arrived at the house, her mother told them she was instructed by Michael to say he wasn't at home, when in fact he was there the entire time. The guards had a warrant. Her mother woke up late that day. Michael was still in bed. She turned around and looked out the window. She said, Oh, there's a squad car outside the gate. Michael said, Oh, Jesus. He put on his shirt and underwear. Michael said, What are they doing? Allison's mother said, They're coming up the path. She answered the door. The Garda said, Is Mr. Cooper here? Allison's mother said, No, I'm afraid he's not. The guard said, Well, can we search the house? Two guard I were stationed at the back of the house. Two stood at each window. Two entered through the front door. Her mother said, Well, I don't know. Have you a warrant? 
They said they did. She let them in. Gardaretti found Michael hiding between the mattress and bottom of his bed. The nightmare wasn't completely over. While he was in custody and giving statements, he invested himself in smearing Allison's character. He claimed Ben's father was a man who stayed with the family for two or three weeks. The man was a friend of Michael's who was going through a rough patch in his marriage. The man never touched Allison. Once when Allison's mother went to visit him in jail, he told her Allison was raped by a neighbor. That didn't happen either. He also told her that when their first child was burned to death, she became pregnant by another man during a bout of mental illness. By doing this, he was trying to prove that Allison was not his child and therefore incest had not occurred. He tried to make Allison look cheap by telling his attorney that his mother wouldn't have Allison over as her guest because she went out drinking with men all night. January 28, 1993. The pornographic photos were submitted as evidence. After Michael had a look at them, he pleaded guilty. Accompanying Allison were her mother, her sister, and two friends. A man named Denny Dempsey and his son were present to vouch for Michael's character. Michael didn't say anything, but at the end of the hearing, he summoned Allison over. Her lawyer said, just go over and see what he wants. She went over and said, well, Michael didn't say a word. He started crying and put his arms around her shoulders. Allison was looking at her attorney. She froze. It was almost as if, after being free from him, she was being dropped back into that situation all over again. A couple of seconds later, he was led away in handcuffs. March 1st, 1993. Michael Cooper was sentenced to six and a half years in prison. He passed Allison on his way out of the building and laughed as he did so. He felt that by getting such a lenient sentence, it had been a victory for him. Allison remained in her relationship with Thomas. Though kissing and other basic affections came easily, she was very apprehensive about sex for some time. She worked it out through counseling. At the onset, she couldn't even bring herself to talk about sex. She also feels uncomfortable when she sees a drunken man at a pub. She found it hard to get close to most men, period. She spent some time attempting to repair her relationship with her mother. They would never talk about the abuse, 